Uh, so, the workshop and my presentation is on a topic which has become more and more uh, important, uh, particularly in light of all the data breaches which we keep hearing about. Uh, so the most recent one in Australia is the Optus data breach. Um, it's not, we, I won't be discussing specifically about the Optus data breach or how that works because that's entirely separate. Uh, but it's just the presentation and this workshop is more about understanding why how your online activities uh, can lead to these uh, data breaches and how there are various layers of people, of agents or intermediaries involved who end up leaking uh, information wittingly or unwittingly and how what you can do possibly to reduce your online um, profile and to make sure your data is a little more secure than it may currently be. Uh, so without further ado, uh, as uh, Winston mentioned, I'll be pausing at the end of every slide to invite any questions if you may have. If you prefer to hold your questions until the end of the presentation, that also works for me. So, firstly, what are cookies? We're not, of course, talking about baker cookies. We're talking specifically about website or online cookies. So, these are browsing tools. So, you have a web browser. Uh, usually, people use a Google Chrome or a Safari, depending on whether you have an Android device or an Apple device. So these are uh, the cookies are uh, website cookies are something which is embedded into those browsers. So when you are browsing the internet or using a web browser, there are web browsing tools used by developers, by web developers for a better experience. Now, what do you mean by a better experience? What do I mean? It basically what the purpose of the cookie is to enable websites to remember you. So when you are, for example, revisiting a website, when you have already searched for something on Google and you go once again and you see that it's no longer a bright blue link, but it's a slightly, um, it's like a purple or a magenta colored link which shows that you have already clicked on it. Or when you go onto your Amazon uh, shopping cart and you see that the items which you had added to the shopping cart last month, last week, yesterday, they're still there. All of these details are, uh, it's possible for the browsers to remember all of this information about you specifically because of these cookies. So it can be your browsing history, it can be your login details, and which uh, is of course, every time you log into a website, every time you go to Gmail and you, uh, log in, it's, sometimes it's convenient for the browser to remember your username and password. It's obviously not ideal from a perspective, but sometimes we prefer it because, you know, we get a little lazy or because it's just convenient. So uh, login details and remember shopping cart details, as well as bank details, depending on whether you are, if you uh, want to re-enter the credit card number every time as your, as well as your CVV and the expiry date, or whether you prefer that the browser remember. So these are the various these are the general items, general uh, items of information. That is items of data, which is which the browsers are able to remember through the use of cookies. And it's not just a browser; it's also the server, that is the company which is um, which is from which you're getting the information. So the Amazon server, the Google server, the Facebook server. So that's what I mean by when I say a server. We'll be dealing with that a little more in uh, detail. Now, how do these cookies work? They are basically small little text files, which, uh, which have small pieces of data used to identify your specific device. So, and they're created by the website server. So say you are visiting amazon.com.au for the, for shopping, for the shopper to, to buy things online. So the cookie is basically is created by that website server, by the Amazon server the first time you visit it and it basically creates kind of like, as you can see, my example here is like a membership uh, card. It gives you an identifier so that when you go back to Amazon, that website, they will remember who you are. They will remember your login details and they'll remember what items you were had left in your shopping. So this is basically stored on your web browser. So what happens is you are using your web browser to visit the Amazon website. Amazon now, now creates a relationship, a membership card for you specifically, for you, when I say for you, for your device specifically, so that, and uh, so that the next time you visit it, 
that information is readily available. How does it do it? They basically create that membership card. They send it to your browser. Your browser keeps it. So this information is actually stored on your computer or on your phone or on your iPad, on your device, essentially. So that the next time you visit the Amazon website, the browser can show up the membership card and say, this is me. These are my details. Therefore, you should already remember who I am and what I was purchasing the last time I had visited this website. So essentially, uh, cookies are used for, and this is the, the, the marketing uh, language which they use. The cookies are used for streamlining user experience through session management. You would prefer as an internet user that some of your information is, is, is remembered or retained so that you don't have to enter it time and again. You would, of course, want to remember what items are on your shopping cart so that whenever the Black Friday sale or whatever other sale Amazon has, whenever that happens, you know already what you want to buy. Then if you want to customize in, cookies, also customize and personalize targeted advertisements. Now this brings into, into uh, question another dimension of what cookies are used for. Often when you are uh, browsing, say Instagram and you're just scrolling or you are generally any, any kind of internet activity, really, you will see that there are advertisements, which are very, by an amazing coincidence, exactly related to what you were searching for. You were looking for flight tickets to Bali for a vacation and the next week or the next day, suddenly you find a, there's a, some kind of a, 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 a travel agency or some kind of an airline which is advertising an offer or a sale or a discount for tickets to Bali. So that isn't just coincidence. That is basically because that information, the fact that you on your own went and looked for tickets to Bali or you looked for to purchase a new car or a new laptop or whatever it is that that information is remembered and that is then used to target advertisements to you. And what ends up happening is that your uh, is that the the general internet that is because of the uh, because of these cookies, the browser uh, then shares your information to these third to, uh, to our servers and the servers then maybe using that information or maybe selling it to other uh, to other individuals to other companies to other data brokers as we'll get to shortly. So what ends up happening is that your the fact that you had requested the fact that you had searched for a flight ticket to Bali is then known to more than just you and the immediate company, the immediate travel agency, the, the immediate sky scanner or whichever jet star, whichever website you were looking at. It's known to more people. And so therefore they use that piece of information to know that, oh, this person wants travel tickets. They want to go to Bali. They want to buy a computer. They want to buy a car. So let's advertise these items to them. Sometimes the ads are irrelevant. Sometimes the ads kick in months after I've had cases where I've had uh, offers for for vacation deals months after I actually already completed the vacation that happens, but sometimes they don't. They are they can be very annoying. Yes, but I also know of cases where I have found cafes and restaurants which uh, are conveniently located and in my budget and offer the kind of cuisine I want because of these advertisements. So there's a there's a pro and there's a con. Uh, there's a pros list and a cons list to uh, website cookies. So target advertisements are enabled because of cookies. And finally, they also track your previous searches or your items to make fresh suggestions. So it may be that you looked at a travel, a deal for traveling to Bali and you realize that and uh, it might be not necessarily a Bali ticket, which will be advertised later. It might be somewhere in the Gold Coast. So somewhere else. Uh, they look. They they notice that you're looking for vacations. They look. They notice that you're looking to purchase electronic items. So maybe not a laptop, maybe an iPad instead. So that's essentially how the world of cookies broadly works. I'll pause here for any questions. Should you have any? I've just got a quick question. Yes, please. Um, sometimes you're asked whether you um, 
want cookies downloaded or not. And sometimes you get the option to say no. Sorry, I'm in a shared office, so you've got some background noise. Um, what what happens in that situation? Do they still get your details? No, no, no. Or what you've been searching? I believe you're asking about whether um, whether when a website says uh, they want to save your cookies and whether they're the strictly necessary cookies or all cookies or essential cookies, right? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, okay, perfect. So it's in, in such a situation, um, the ideal thing to do is, is to select the strictly necessary or uh, the essential cookies because all the cookies are not necessarily required. Uh, now I say that because there are certain cookies which are needed by the server which is the com which is the the Amazon or the uh, Facebook or whatever it is your website you're visiting, for them to be able to function to provide you the very basic functionality, to be able to provide you say a search function on the Amazon uh, website or on the Facebook uh, uh, search page. Now those are essential, so yes, you should definitely say yes to them because if you say no to that, you can't proceed. So there's no point in you visiting that a Facebook or an Amazon if you're not going to accept the strictly necessary cookies. Every other item of cookies, which is for say, uh, they'll say for preferences, for advertisements, uh, for uh, they'll say for user experience. You can say no to all of that because it really doesn't make any difference. And it gives them access to more information than they need in order to, uh, to, in order to complete that transaction. You look at this from a very a pure transactional perspective. You are, you are giving them some information about you and in return they are giving you some of the information you are searching for. You don't want to be in a situation where you are giving more information than you need to give. They might want your, they might, they might want uh, your search history, they might want your bank details, they might want your, your center link number. I mean being of course I'm exaggerating here. But the point is, all, if all you need to give is your name and your email ID, why should you give more than that? So my suggestion always is to give is to always uh, select the strictly necessary cookies and nothing more. In fact, if you on most of your browsers, I personally use Mozilla Firefox because it has better privacy uh, software software inbuilt into the browser. And what it allows me to do is when I visit the websites. The browser will tell the website that, that I want only strictly necessary cookies. So even when that pop-up comes saying accept cookies and I go to check what cookies they're asking me to accept, I have I've noticed that I've, it's automatically saying strictly necessary cookies because that is my default browser setting. All right. Anyway, we can take questions at the end if anyone wants. Uh, moving on. So just an example of uh, what you're, what I'm talking about. So this is again from my search history from uh, from Mozilla. So you can see that these are the websites that says uh, that the following websites store cookies and site data on your computer. So these are the websites which I have visited. Of course, you can see some shopping websites because I was it was getting cold. The uh, so I was wanted winter wear. So I looked at the Kathmandu website, and you can see how many cookies they are storing on your browser. More cookies can be obviously more problematic. As you see, the largest number with 99 cookies is the Google ecosystem. Because there, uh, there the, the company Google works through advertisements. So you will have all of those on the right side from a simple Google search, all the advertisements which come up. It may even be from Gmail, from whatever other uh, uh, promotional material is there on Gmail. Surprisingly, the second most which I noticed was the PTV website, the Public Transport Victoria website. Uh, there aren't advertisements there, but it's interesting to note that there are some cookies which are also on that website which you may not be aware of, which may have nothing to do with your login details necessarily. But then on the, on the flip side, uh, the good thing is that you should be able to rely more on governmental websites uh, storing this information about you uh, because anywhere the government has so much information about you. The question is whether you should also share this information with uh, private companies and which are not big corporations but smaller corporations. We'll get to that uh, towards the end. So as you can see there are also so New York Times also has quite a few cookies. The BBC website also has uh, quite a few cookies. Uh, th these two Live Law, Live Mint, these are all uh, India related um, 
news websites and you'll notice that news websites will also have a lot of cookies because uh, as we know newspapers and therefore also news websites require they function on they have an ad revenue which they depend on so there are advertisements on these news websites so these cookies are generated not just by the BBC's or the New York Times itself it is also generated by other people who are advertising on that same page so you might only be reading the the news article but on the side there are some advertisements which you may not care about you may care about but those advertisements even though you may not click on those links they also create cookies which are sent to you which are then basically uh, recorded which record your activities so it's not just the BBC or the New York Times or whatever it is or the ABC not just that website it's also who else is there on that website that ABC or BBC have allowed to be there on their website who is collecting information on whosoever behalf in addition to ABC or BBC also collecting the information so you have given your consent to ABC and BBC you don't know about these other parties so those other parties are the ones who you know who you need to be aware of just a few more examples um, this is a little technical uh, but essentially this is how it works so your client is basically you or me the server is your Amazon or, or Facebook or BBC or whatever it is so you have a client which is asking for access to the Amazon to the Amazon website so it says get HTTP whatever I, I, I need this information from you Amazon says okay here is your membership card session ID 12345 the next time I go on Amazon how does my browser uh, make sure that Amazon remembers me it is because the browser says okay this is my membership card you all do you have my details this is to confirm you have my details it's essentially to make sure when the first time you go to a gym and you get a membership card you go up to the counter you get a membership card you get, and you sign in all the details and everything the next day when you visit the gym again or the next week or the next month you don't want to always have to go to the to the uh, to the counter and sign yourself in you just have a membership card which automatically swipes through the gate check and allows you to go through so that is the advantage of having a cookie so that's what in this case is happening the the client which is you your browser is showing that membership card which is allowing you to swipe through automatically to the Amazon server and that membership card that cookie has details of the last things that you did when you visited the Amazon website the same way that say a membership card will have information about the last workout you did or your diet plan or whatever depending on the kind of membership you're talking about you might have a membership uh, which is in, like say a gym membership which is essentially you know your history of what uh, you might have recorded you know I have certain dietary restrictions if you are going to a dietitian I have certain uh, physical uh, physical issues so I, I have a I have a weak knee so whenever you uh, whenever you are booking an appointment with a personal trainer next the system automatically knows that you have a weak knee or, or you have back issues or whatever it is and therefore that information you don't need to repeat it similarly here your browser doesn't need to repeat you don't need to repeat the information that you were looking to buy a laptop or an iPad on the Amazon website or that you were looking to buy a flight ticket to Bali on the Jetstar website um, moving on uh, so this is an easier way to explain what I without the uh, without the jargon so there is a browser which is again your web browser there's a server which is the Amazon or the Facebook or the BBC web server what happens is the browser is is providing the username and password for act for getting into your Facebook account the the what Facebook does is it creates a session in that database and sorry if the if the uh, the words are not very clear I had to stretch out this image to put it on the slide it creates a session in the database and what it does is it create when I say it creates a session it basically creates a cookie attaches that cookie and sends it as a response to the browser so it returns the cookie to the browser the next time when the browser is accessing Facebook because Facebook has already given me a cookie with this information with regard to your username and your password when I when the browser sends the request when I say then it basically sends it with the cookie so that 
username and password is already there. That's why when you revisit a website, you will find that the website remembers your username, remembers your password, and all you have to do is press enter. So the website looks up, looks up, checks the session uh, in its database, gets this information, and gives you provide access by provide, providing a profile matching session. It matches the information it has in its records with the information its browser is giving, sees that they're the same person, and therefore the same ID is verified, and then it sends a response to the client. So you have easier access to the Facebook web page or the Amazon web page. Uh, moving to types of cookies. So there's session cookies. Session cookies are temporary in nature, as you can see. They're used while navigating a website, stored in your RAM, gets automatically deleted when the session ends. Okay, so it's essentially uh, the moment you close the browser, that information gets deleted. So these are fine. These are essentially uh, things like when you are accessing several links on a website. You're on Amazon. You've, you're, you're, you're on Amazon to buy a pair of shoes. Uh, you look at a pair of shoes. You look at, uh, of course, Amazon uh, suggests other shoes which are similar to that. So you look at that as well. So the fact that you can go back, press the back button and go to the previous uh, web pages in the same website, that is essentially comes from session cookies. But the moment you close that, you can't go back to that anymore. It might be there in your history, but that of course depends on persistent cookies. Persistent cookies, they remain on a device indefinitely. So when you look at your browser, there'll be an option of clearing all cookies. That clearing or deleting all cookies is basically the persistent cookies, which is the browser is talking about. And that might be things like your authentication, your, uh, it might be your authentication details, your, your, uh, if you don't care about the fact that uh, your browser was remembering your username and password or your bank details, then you can delete your cookies on a regular basis. It basically is a good practice because uh, yes, it's a little more cumbersome that once a week or once a month that you delete your cookies and you have to re-enter your login details. But it also ensures that, that your cookies are not being uh, distributed or shared or rather sold across the world, across the internet uh, with the web world. Now moving to, then there's, there are also third party cookies. And this is why I'm just making sure I didn't realize I can't see everyone. Yeah, okay. Um, third party cookies is essentially, is generated, and I'm just reading here, generated by sources other than the web page you are using. So remember when I talk, I mentioned the BBC or the ABC uh, news pages, there's of course, you are visiting a BBC web page or an ABC web page to read the article. But there's also other things, other things that are happening on that page. There are ad links on that web page. You might not be clicking on the ad links, but those ad links know, those ads know that you are there and they'll by virtue of creating a cookie for you since you are visiting the main page. The main page is the BBC page, but there are also these smaller links which are also there on that page. So those are generated by merely visiting the primary web page the BBC page and these are often created by data brokers and this is where you will we'll get into privacy breach territory. It's often created by data brokers to collect user information. So these are people who have some kind of a tie up with the BBC or an ABC. The more dodgy the website, the more number of tie ups with these data brokers. So you should, you can have some, uh, some comfort in knowing that a BBC or an ABC will not be doing it. But a random, uh, a smaller company, a smaller enterprise maybe, uh, may have these, uh, these tie-ups with these data brokers because the data brokers are giving them money to be allowed to be on the website. So what happens is these data brokers, they have these advertisements. They collect these information and this is essentially third party cookies which are generated. And the reason they're called third parties are because you are the first party accessing the website. The website is the second party giving you information. And then there are these third parties on the side, on the fringe, who you may not know about, who also have information about you, even though you have no idea who they are or what they're doing. Now, there has been a recent change in the last, let's say about two years, 
uh, among major browser platforms. So you have Google, Apple, Mozilla, the major uh, uh, browsers being uh, Chrome, Safari, and Firefox respectively. And they basically are trying to phase out third party cookies. They have come to the realization that why are we allowing third parties on our browsers? That they are in, they are building in blockers, browser or basically ad blockers to prevent these third parties from leeching onto their browsers. And they are creating what's instead in, in place of third party cookies, they are creating first party cookies. Their idea is that we are, we are the ones who the, the user is visiting, the users going to Facebook or an Amazon or, a, or a, let's say a, a BBC. We are, they're, they're visiting that web page for our information. So they, we should be the ones they're dealing with. So these are directly created by the website and it's safer if they're from more reputable websites or larger corporations. And these examples, Facebook, Google Chrome, New York Times, they're all examples of first party websites which have proactively denied access to third party cookies. What that means is they have, they have put up blockers on their website which say that a, a third party data broker cannot quietly, surreptitiously get this information about our users from our source. But what ends up happening is that the data brokers approach a Facebook or a Google Chrome to purchase this information. So because of this phasing out of third party, uh, third party cookies, the data brokers have found a way around and they have said that, okay, we can't do it ourselves. So we'll pay you to do it on our behalf. So this has led to essentially a, a market, an industry of cookie intermediaries and data brokers. Now I know I've been talking about data brokers for the last few minutes. So let's discuss these two terms. Who's a cookie intermediary or a data intermediary? A cookie or a data intermediary is basically a browser platform or a website who sells customers information to the brokers through first party cookies. So what they do is we already have first party cookies, which is the website itself creating a cookie for our login details and Amazon creating a cookie so that they can remember what our, what items were in our shopping cart. That's a first party cookie. What the data intermediary, uh, what, what, so these are the data intermediaries who's create, who are creating these, uh, these cookies. So examples are Facebook, Bank of America, and also back closer to home, of course, to Australia is Combank. And uh, so it's not just things happening in the US, it's also most certainly happening here in Australia. Now, what happens is the data intermediary then has a transaction with these data brokers. Who is a data broker? A data broker is a business that knowingly collects and sells or licenses to third parties the brokered personal information of a customer with whom the business does not have any direct relationship. They collect information from a wide variety of partners to create a digital profile of the individual. So what is happening here? You are visiting an Amazon or a Facebook. They are first part, they are first party, uh, first, uh, first party uh, uh, data holder, uh, first sorry. They have first party cookies. Now these brokers, they want that information. They want those cookies. They buy that information and they use the word share, but really it's purchase. It's really, it's just a sell and a buy and sell transaction. So they will buy this information from a Facebook or an Amazon or a whoever. And why will they buy that information? Because they are buying some information from Amazon regarding your shopping history. They are taking some information from Google regarding your search history. They are taking some information from an ABC or BBC regarding your, your political preferences. So all of this they put together and they basically are able to create a virtual or a digital profile of who you are, what you like spending, uh, spending money on, what your political preferences might be, where you like traveling, all of this information they put together to make, to make a virtual profile of you. And then they sell that to whoever is the highest bidder, which may be a, it may be a marketing company, it may be a social media company. It may be anyone who basically wants to understand their consumers better. That's a nice way to put it. It might also be someone who wants to 
uh, abuse that information and try and brainwash their consumers or their brainwash people like as, as we have seen with the in the 2016 Cambridge Analytica scandal uh, involving Facebook. So it can work both ways because information is one thing but using the information can also lead to an abuse of the information. So that is where the breaches start. Now due to a change in the privacy policies with respect to these third party cookies, data brokers are now asking, as I said, I've already covered this, they're now asking first party partners to collect user information themselves. Okay. Now of course it depends on, so uh, in 2019 when Facebook first uh, scrapped their third party data broker policy, it was found that it wasn't, they hadn't suddenly grown a conscience. What they were doing was they were selling the same information which they were themselves collecting through first party, uh, through first party cookies, they were selling them to data brokers. And they, it wasn't until the European Union's, the GDPR regulation, which is, a, which is the general data protection regulation, kicked in and stopped them from doing it. It wasn't until then that Facebook actually stopped doing it because that's what, I mean, well, Facebook and maybe arguably a lot of tech companies do is that they find loopholes to try and uh, find ways to make money, to monetize uh, people and people's minds, people's um, people's eyeballs is a, is a technical legal term uh, until someone, some government somewhere tells them that they can't. Now, where, where does this lead, lead us to in terms of breaches? So, just before I head to that, I mentioned Combank as an example. Uh, this is uh, the text from uh, Combank from their privacy policy. It says we may share your information with third parties for the reasons mentioned in how we you uh, for the reason mentioned how we use your uh, information or where the law otherwise allows us allow or requires us to do so. Now the way they they read this line otherwise allows us basically means if they don't tell us that it's not allowed we are going to do it. Always assume that until until and unless someone tells them very clearly that X is not allowed. They will say, okay, we'll continue with X. If they say, if the law says X is not allowed, they'll say, okay, but we're doing Y and Z. We're not doing X, even though Y and Z are very close to X. So, and if you go to the, uh, go to your uh, terms and conditions on, on the Combank website, there are a variety of, of uh, third parties with whom they share this information. It may, it's, it may be within the Combank group, which is okay, but it may also be an actual third party who has nothing to do with banking or with Combank. Any questions before I proceed? So, so um, in terms of the information that they share, like, uh, is it just information gathered from the? So, I'm trying to understand, like, information gathered from cookies. Does that include everything you fill into a form? Let's say you fill in, like, a like a contact form, um, or like a like an inquiry form, or like a help form, or whatever. Right. Is that also captured in the cookies as well? Yes. Uh, uh, but with the larger corporation, which is why I'm, I'm always suggesting that if, it's, if you're giving your information to a bigger company like a Combank, it's reliable because they will give you the option of do you want us to remember this. Right. If that, that's ideally, that's preferable because then you can choose. Mm. Consumer privacy, data breaches, all of this is centered around user consent. You should be knowing what information of yours is being shared. Yep. If you are okay with it, not a problem. But you should have the option of saying that you are not okay with it. Yeah. So if a particular website is, is giving you the option of forgetting that information, that credit card information, then that means it's a more responsible website and therefore something which you can trust a little more. No one, you can't really trust anything in the online world, but um, a little more you can trust them. Mm. I just have another question yes. regarding to like um, the, the persistent, the session cookies and persistent cookies. Okay. The position could be stay on your browser until you, you clear it yourself. Yes. Um, can anyone, anyone apart from the, the website that you're visiting, that that cookie pertains to, access those cookies? So let's say can a completely different website access a cookie um, that was made for a visit to another website that's not related to them? Uh, in two ways, yeah. the answer is yes, in two ways. One is through those ad links which I had mentioned. Yep. If on a BBC page there are also some advertisements. So those cookies are also there. Yeah. So you have unknowingly said yes to those cookies. So that is an, uh, a very, that's, an in, that's a legal concept known as implied consent. 
where by virtue of visiting the primary web page, you are also consenting to the other links on that page. So that is one thing. The other thing is because these data brokers are also selling this information all over the place. So those, they also have that information from your cookies, even though you don't know who they are. Yeah. So that's another level of, of, uh, of privacy violation. Yeah. And so once you clear your, your cookies, um, obviously if they've already taken the information that that's too, too bad. Yeah, you can't get that. Yeah. Um, but it prevents them from later on tapping into it and getting more information. Exactly. And also the next time you visit that website, you are a new person. In their eyes, you're a new person. So whatever new information you're doing, mm -hmm. your new online activity doesn't get added to your old digital profile mm -hmm. because it thinks you're a new person. Yeah. So it's, you can get to like, you're basically what you're doing is you are fragmenting the amount of knowledge that they have about you. And the more you fragment it, the more difficult it is for them to make one profile about you. Thanks. So how do we clear all those cookies? There's an option on the browser for just clearing the cookies. So when you go to the settings uh, of your whatever browser it is, there'll be a cookies uh, sub uh, sub option. And in that, it'll be a manage cookies where you can clear the cookies and the cache. We can provide you more information, Kath, um, yeah, after the presentation if you want, yeah. Thanks. So now, why am I talking about bigger corporations necessarily as opposed to smaller corporations? So there was a, there's an ongoing uh, study which is being conducted by three uh, faculty members at, uh, I'm trying to forget to remember where they are. I think they are in the University of uh, Washington um, in Seattle. Uh, they are basically conducting a study on data intermediaries and, uh, and data brokers. What they have found is number one, Larger intermediaries, so larger websites owned by larger corporations such as a Google or a Facebook, they face less competition. If they are facing less competition, then they share or they sell. I use the word sell even though everywhere online they use the word share. It's actually selling. They sell less customer information with third party data brokers. Very simply put, bigger the company, less insecurity. They are very happy with themselves. They don't need the extra money. They don't need to sell the information to third party data brokers. If it's a smaller tech company, such as these new startups, oh, the mic is, the, uh, the smaller tech companies, such as, such as these new startups, then if they are facing more competition, you look at education technology, what's known as ed tech, which is booming uh, in the, because of COVID, a lot of ed tech companies came up all over the world. They're all competing with each other for pretty much the same audience. So, they, uh, they are facing more competition. So therefore they are more likely to sell your user information with third party data brokers. So that's at one level at the data intermediary level. At the next level of data brokers, there is a lower likelihood, which means there's a lesser chance of a data breach among data brokers who face less competition. So if you have a larger data broker, who is again secure in their position, doesn't feel the need to undercut their competition. Therefore, they have a, uh, they have better privacy, better quality of privacy. On the other hand, there's a higher chance, a higher likelihood of a data breach among brokers, among data brokers who are competing on price points. Now, how does this work? The, these two points of data brokers is, is, is very simple. You have data brokers who are amassing this information about you, who are creating digital profiles or virtual profiles about you. So you have two competing data profiles. Let's assume you have two competing data brokers. They both have profiles about you. They are both trying to sell this information to a marketing company. Now they will of course try to offer the best price possible to that marketing company because the marketing company will just look at the price. They will look at whatever is cheaper for them. If someone is offering, or if, if, if data broker A is offering the same information at $100, whereas data broker B is giving that information, is selling that information at $120, the marketing company will go for data broker A because it's cheaper. It's a, it's, you're, they're saving $20 per person. Um, in that scenario, you have to wonder about what 
data broker A is doing that's different from data broker B that they are able to undercut the price. And the answer almost always is that they are sacrificing on the quality of protection on the amount of let's say an antivirus software that they are using to protect everyone's information including you. They have a treasure trove of uh, data of digital profiles about everyone. If they don't have a good enough lock securing that information, it's because they decide to, to basically save money to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to cut costs in buying a good enough lock, in buying a good enough antivirus software, which makes them more susceptible, more liable to a data breach because it's easier to break a smaller lock. So that is where you have to wonder about why, about how secure is your information with smaller companies, which in turn will rely on smaller data brokers because they're all trying, they, they're, uh, they're all trying to basically, you know, reach a profit margin. They're all trying to break even most of these companies. So they will do anything to save a dollar here or there. Any questions on this? So just to clarify, yes. the big companies like Facebook and Google will generally deal with bigger data brokers, which are more secure in the handling of Absolutely. Information. Absolutely. Okay. And, and, and do these big companies um, like Facebook and Google specify the names of the data brokers that they deal with? Is Not necessarily, but I can provide that information uh, to you. If uh, So again, in that uh, study, it hasn't come yet. This one. These are the authors of the draft paper, Chiong, Sokol, and Wang. Yep. Uh, they are basically in, in their report. Uh, they've identified who the bigger data brokers are, like a company like a Facebook or an Amazon or a Google that they deal with, yep. and like how uh, how their that information is therefore most secure. Right, right. And these are not household names. These are not household names. But although one high household name is Microsoft, Microsoft is a, is operates everywhere. It's both. It's at various levels. It's it's also a data broker level, and it's a it's an intermediary and it's a computer and it's a software. That's why Microsoft is so quietly profitable because in the last 30 years, they've basically done, they have the length and breadth of the tech industry. And that's also what Amazon is trying to do. Amazon is also a data broker, but not at the same level as Microsoft. Um, all right. So what, what is Australia? What is the Australian government doing about this? What is Australia's cookie policy? The, the general rule in Australia, as per uh, uh, the Australian privacy protection law, is that privacy policies must list all cookies and trackers embedded on a website, even the hidden ones. So it's mandatory that whenever you go to a website, it is the responsibility of the website owner to make sure that their privacy policy is updated and exhausted. That is, it's informing all users of all cookies and trackers that can be privacy infringing. The idea, as I said previously, is about consent. They should tell you what is happening on that website. So you at least know whether you choose to read that privacy policy is a separate question, but it should be available for you to read and say yes or no to. Then Australia's Privacy Act of 1988 and the Privacy APPs, the Australian Privacy Principles, they require a website to have an updated privacy policy, which is known as the APP Privacy Policy. That, that also informs users of how it collects and handles personal information. So if when you look at the ComBank, that little one screenshot which I shared is of course a very long uh, list of, uh, of terms and conditions of their privacy policy, which if you go to the ComBank website, they'll have that, which will have details of how they're collecting the information, how, who they're sharing the information with, why they're sharing that information and how they're sharing that information. And then, so what are APPs? APPs, the Australian Privacy Principles, are a set of 13 codes of conduct to be followed in order to be compliant with the Act and categorize this information as either personal information. So things like your name, or your email address, your date of birth, maybe bank details also, and sensitive personal information, which are things like your religious beliefs, uh, then your uh, racial or ethnicity, uh, uh, your racial, ethnic, ethnic uh, background, your sexual orientation, all of this information, which is considered as sensitive personal information. Now, who enforces this, this law? 
It, this Privacy Act in the APPs are enforced by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, which is the OAIC, who both guides companies in legal compliance, investigates and inform, enforces breaches of the privacy law. Why am I telling you the legal background? Because I'm a lawyer and also because in case something goes wrong, you know who to go to. You know that the correct authority is the OAIC. And that concludes, uh, sorry, one last point. Oh, I forgot this slide. How are we on time? Oh, we're almost done. Just a, a question regarding the previous one. Yes. So the, the Australian like um, privacy cookie policy only only affects um, companies that are either based here or have a branch here. If it's a company that that you visit, let's say it's BBC, yeah, that has no Australian branch, right? They do not have to comply with the uh, cookie policy. Is that correct? Um. So they will have to. So there was a, a in two thousand nine. There was a case against Facebook where Facebook tried to get out of yeah. uh, this liability saying that, oh, you know, we're not based in Australia, yeah. to which the ACCC, which is the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, basically said that it doesn't matter whether you are registered in the US or wherever in, in Ireland. Yeah. But the point is that your revenue is being generated from Australia. Yeah. Your users are sitting in Australia. So therefore, Australian law, Australian consumer law, also applies to you. Yeah. So by that logic, Australian privacy law would also apply to a Facebook or a BBC or whoever else. Yeah. It becomes globally applicable. And what Australia is doing is they're basically following the, the footsteps of the European Commission, yeah. which in which is the first international body to create uh, these privacy rules called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, yeah. which basically says that you want to do whatever you, you do, whatever you want to do, the users must say yes. Their consent is required. Yeah, yeah. Without consent, you cannot do any funny business. Yeah. So what if let's say you, you you buy you buy something online from a small music shop in America that has no dealings with Australia? Right. But Australian the Australian law can't prevent them from like can't can't, can't enforce them because they can't enforce the browsers, right? They can't enforce what people do on the internet. If it's to do with you know, is is that a way they can So uh, that that's not it's not specifically browser related here. I'll put it in another situation. Yeah. In your example, yeah. if I have a problem, if I'm sitting in Australia and I have a problem with that American company, yeah. Yeah. I as a consumer will have rights under Australian law yeah. to litigate against that American company yeah. because the transaction, the revenue was being generated from Australia and because I am sitting in Australia. Right. So I have some legal recourse. Yeah. But the so, odds of actually Winning anything like that is very slim, isn't it? That, of course, yeah. In in reality, that will depend on uh, how uh, on who your lawyer is, who their lawyer is, and how much of an effort you're willing to make. Yeah. That's always the case with any uh, legal dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, moving to what you can do to on a day-to-day -day basis to protect yourself. And this is the last slide. So install a browser extension which can block data trackers and adware. So you have these privacy badger, Ghostry, and uh, uBlock origin. They all have good reputations. I personally use uBlock because it's inbuilt into my, into Mozilla Firefox. Oh. So it's just easier. So I barely have, I've noticed since I installed this, I've had very few cookies uh, because uh, it just blocks a lot of things. It also blocks a lot of pop-ups, which is problematic uh, because I just, I don't, I realize I can't find that page, which is apparently supposed to come up. Uh, but you just said, it's just, I would prefer uh, having actively saying yes to a pop-up or saying yes to a cookie than uh, it happening without my knowledge. Then you can adjust your online behavior to help, help protect yourself from data brokers. Don't per post personal information on social media. This of course goes without saying. Um, don't answer online quizzes and don't enter online competitions. Just, you know, there'll be a lot of promotional material. Suddenly you'll be like, you'll get a hundred dollars off or, or win thousand dollars from this, uh, from this lottery amount. Uh, and I say this in the, in the aftermath of the Melbourne cup. Um, so essentially just be careful with who you are dealing with. What is the authenticity of that website and what kind of information are they asking for? It may be a complete scam. It might be entirely wrong. Or it might just be a situation where it's an actual lucky draw competition or, uh, or, uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, an online, uh, an online betting uh, pool. Uh, but you are still giving a lot of your personal information, which to not necessarily the most reputable of sources. And these sites will provide valuable information to data brokers. So that's why you should just be aware of what these websites are.
Then check your privacy settings regularly. Make sure to delete your phone apps that you're no longer using. Um, like you might have, uh, there, are, there are some apps which are clear uh, data uh, violation. There's this a very popular um, cam scanner, which was there to essentially to take a very, like, like very good quality scans of any documents from your phone. But cam scanner was uh, flagged as, as a, as was flagged in a data breach a couple of years ago. So essentially what uh, they, um, they share their information with everyone to, to put it uh, briefly. Oh, uh, yeah. Even this, the scan that you take, this sharing benefit, my goodness. Possibly, yeah. I mean, if, if they're sharing your information, then yeah. the pictures you're taking is irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you take a picture, for example, of your credit card or something like that. Yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, then sign up for a VPN, a virtual private network, which is uh, when you connect to that, to the internet through a VPN, or your IP address is therefore hidden, so they can't really track you. Uh, and it, they basically en encrypt your data uh, through the browser. Of course, what you should do is make sure that your VPN doesn't sell your data to others. <laughs> the best way to do that is to see if it's a free VPN. Anything free is a little questionable. So don't always, like internet is was built on the foundations of everything should be free. Yes, information should be free, but information which you want to access and information which you're willingly given, not anything else. Um, but if, if someone is offering like a free free service, a free software, there's always be uh, some kind of a catch. So just, you know, uh, be conscious of what exactly you're signing up for. Uh, that concludes uh, this presentation. Just one last point to keep in mind. Um, this is a this is a quote by from a Google insider, which was quoted by uh, Rod Sims, who is the last chairperson of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. That people say the data is, is the new gold. Data is not the new gold. It's the new uh, uranium. Because sometimes you can make money from it, but it can also be radioactive. It's dangerous to store. It has military use and it is being actively used by the military all over the world. And you generally don't want to concentrate it too much because it's regulated. <laughs> all right, that concludes the uh, presentation. Any questions from anyone here or online?